Scripture reading for this morning is from Psalms chapter 15. If you would like to read along with me, it's on the monitors. Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary, who may live in your holy mountain? He whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue, who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow man, who despises a vile man but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps his earth oath even when it hurts and does not change his mind or their mind, who sends his money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent, he who does these things will never be shaken. Psalms 15. Thank you. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> it is so good to see you and to be here worshiping with you this morning. And for those of you that are online joining us for this worship, we welcome you. We're glad that you have chosen to work and worship with us today. I'll start out by saying how difficult it is to face the unknown without confidence. And who, without knowing, knowing can you count on? God is the one that brings us reality and foundation and blessing. It's reality for people with no relationship with God the Almighty, no relationship with Jesus our Savior, that it is so difficult to face the unknown because there is no confidence. It's somewhat like the story of Albert Einstein. He was on a train. He was traveling to an out-of-town engagement. The conductor stopped to punch his ticket, and he started to look for it. He didn't find it in his pocket. He grabbed his briefcase. He started opening that up. He rifled through everything he had. He couldn't find his ticket. And the conductor very patiently said, It's all right, Dr. Einstein. I know who you are. I'm sure you bought a ticket. And he turned and he went on down and he punched everybody else's ticket. And just before he left the car, he turned around and he saw Einstein down on his knees underneath his seat, searching, searching, searching for that ticket. And so he quietly came back and he said, Dr. Einstein, really, you don't have to worry about the ticket. I know who you are. I'm sure you bought a ticket. He said, I know who I am also. What I don't know is where I'm going today. <laughs> <laughs> you're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. You know where you're going. You have had your sins washed away. You don't have to fear. You know where you are going. And that's what I want us to walk out of here knowing today. There are several things that we as Christians can be sure of and we can know because God promised us and we don't have to doubt his promises. First John chapter 5 and verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Wow. I don't have to face death because physical death is just a minor blip. I live for a certain time in this life and then I pass. And then I live forever. John wrote his gospel so people could and would believe. John wrote his letters to help the believer become better 
and stronger disciples. And so this text that I'm going to share with you today, 1 John 5, 13 through 20, has to do with becoming stronger disciples. Five simple things that come from that text that we can know. The first thing that we can know is we have eternal life based on that verse I just read. No question, no doubt, a secure foundation to stand on. Members of the churches of Christ sometimes have difficulty believing this point. Are you saved? Oh, I hope I am. Not, are you saved? Yes, I know that my Redeemer lives. Are you saved? Well, I hope that he'll forgive me for my sins. Instead of understanding that the blood of Jesus Christ washes away our sins, cleanses us, and makes us fit to stand in God's presence. This isn't a new idea without a biblical foundation. This is a promise from God. You can know you're saved right now. It's not, I'll know I'm saved someday when I get to be with him and he, and he says, come on in. No, according to the scripture, which is inspired by God, it's proven by miracles. You can know today that you are the possessor of eternal salvation because you're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and walking in the light. And that walking in the light lets the blood of Jesus continue to cleanse us from sin. You can go home today secure. You can know. I want to make that a new church of Christ reality. You can know that God is waiting for you and that there is eternal glory that is coming and we are going to enjoy that together. In verse 13, when it says in the last part of the verse, you may know that you have eternal life. It's the Greek word gnosko. It means knowledge. And if I just said that and walked away from it, well, that'd be a really interesting fact. Gnosko means knowledge. It's the way we have knowledge. Gnosko is the idea of experiential knowledge. He slapped me. How do you know? I still feel it. I have the experience. There's a red hand mark on my face. How do you know the meal was good? Oh, I know it was good. I've just experienced it. He's saying you can experience the fact that you have eternal life. Well, how can I do that? I haven't passed yet. Well, let me tell you, this is how you can know. Accept the scripture as God's word. We are people that have once lived in a generation when your word really meant something. If somebody gave you their word, you can trust it's going to happen. Even to their hurt, it's going to happen. And we long for those days again somewhat, don't we? We may never see them again. But as far as God is concerned, if he said it's going to happen, it will happen. You can trust him or you can fear him. If he says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. How can I know I can accept scripture as God's word? 2 Timothy 3 verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God. Second, I can receive the good news of what God has done through Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3. The second part of the verse and then into verse 4. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day. If God cared so much about making you right and assuring eternal salvation for you, it would have to be something big. And anyone that is willing to give their son someone, that's big. And God did that with Jesus. He was buried. He was raised on the third day show death couldn't hold him and God's got a plan for us to know in our hearts death can't hold us there is eternal life with him third believe in him as savior fourth 
respond to the gospel. Fifth, hold God's promise confidently. Know that you have eternal life and look forward to that. There were witnesses to his resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 5 and 6. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. Most of them still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, Paul said, he appeared to me. Believe what the scripture says. And when you believe in him and obey him, then eternal life is yours. And you can know that he will never withdraw his love from you. I could stop there, couldn't I? We go home feeling good. But there's more. There's more. How does the believer respond to a call like this? As victoriously as the words of the Apostle Paul out of Romans 8. I'm going to read the highlights from verses 31 through 39. But this is good. Go with me. Let it touch your souls. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God's for us, who could be against us? He who didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life. Is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship? or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. In all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. And I'm convinced, neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither the present or the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So number one, we can know we have eternal life. Number two, we can know this. The Father hears our prayers. 1 John 5, 14 and 15, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. We know that He hears us, whatever we ask. We know that we have what we asked of Him. If we ask, God hears. Did you see it jump right out of verse 14? If we ask according to his will, he hears us. Verse 15, he hears us whatever we ask. God is listening. Oh, Lord, forgive me. I just hurt my sister. Forgive me and help me. He hears. Oh, God. Control me. Can put a control on this mouth of mine. Help me. I've hurt my brother. He hears. That could be our prayer. Something else could be our prayer. He's listening. I watched out for my sons. I did. I don't know how he got there that day that I looked up and this van was coming to a halt. And Nathan was standing in the middle of a highway in Mississippi. He was still in a diaper. I don't know how he got from us and where we were out into the road. But I watched for my son. And I got him back. And I made sure that the rest of my life, I told him, don't go out into the highway. Don't play on the train tracks. I haven't changed. I watch out for Zoe Grace. And I say, baby, don't go out and play in the street like that. We've got this whole nice yard with all these trees. You play right here. God's like that. He watches out for us. He sees where we're going. He knows what we're thinking. He knows what we're planning. And he wants us to be in places where we'll be safe. He cares for us with a father's love. 
put a million dollars in a checking account for you down at one bank. It's your account with your name on it, your address, your privileges. Guess what you suddenly are? A millionaire. And guess what? It's not going to do you any good if you don't know how to get the money out. If nobody ever told you how to write a check and you don't know what it's like to take the checks that come along with this gift and say, to Alan Cooper, one million dollars to be paid to the bearer. Here, paper is nice, but I want my billion. You're never going to get to enjoy that. Too many of us have bank accounts that are full of God's things, and we're forgetting how to write our checks. We forget to draw on the spiritual reservoir that we have in the Father. Or we don't understand how to draw from that spiritual reservoir to live the successful Christian life. Ask Him. Pray. He listens. We've been told by John. He's the Father of good gifts. We've been told by Jesus out of Matthew 7, verse 7 and 8. Ask and it will be given to you. Dip into that reservoir. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks. The door will be open. Verse 11. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. Nathan's son. Don't play in the highway. You scare me when you do that. Please stay off the railroad tracks. That's not a place for a little boy to be. If we who are evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? Hebrews 4 and verse 6. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Have confidence. So we can know the Father hears our prayers. Number three, we can know that holiness is a birthright of our 1 John chapter 5, verse 18. Anyone born of God does not continue to sin. Why? If you're born of God, you're in His family. And God's not a sinner. And we may be cursed with some physical baggage. And we may be tempted to sin. And we may yield to sin. But if we're in His family, it's not our goal to sin. It's not what we want to do. It's not what we desire. And we're looking for that way that he has made for us to step away from that and to get out of that temptation. We're born into a different kind of family. We share his spiritual genes. We have family honor to keep. We do not want to dishonor him. Listen to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. No temptation is overtaking you except what's common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. It doesn't mean, young Christian, old Christian, it doesn't mean that you won't be tempted. It means you don't have to make it your practice. You don't have to say, I can't help it, so and therefore, I'm going to do that. Jesus didn't do it. I see you nodding your heads. I see you go, oh, I see your expressions. I sympathize with you about being tempted. I sympathize with you that sometimes it's hard to say no to yourself. 
And yet this verse stands. He won't let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. And when we are tempted, He will provide for us a way out so we can endure it. A missionary in India. She was a nurse on a medical mission. Was told of a critically ill man and she went to his home. She needed assistance to get him from his house to the hospital if his life was going to be saved. She couldn't do it by herself. She wasn't strong enough. She looked out. Who can I get to help me? And she looked down the street and she saw two Indian holy men sitting together intoning their worship. You've heard it. Um. And she rushed out and she said, this man's going to die. I need you to help me get him to the hospital. And she said, I will never forget the look in the eyes of one of them that flashed with anger as he said, we, we are holy men. We never help anyone. They couldn't be disturbed. They believed they were worshiping. That's not how God showed his holiness. In his holiness, he was active to reach out. In our holiness, we're active to do the same. So we can know holiness is our birthright. Number four, we can know this. We are separated from the world. First John 5 and verse 19 we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Well, it may be. But we're different from the world. We chose to be different from the world. God called us and we said, that sounds right. And for forgiveness, it sounds lovely. And so the world may be under the control of the evil one, but I don't have to be with God's strength and God's forgiveness we don't have to be under his control. We're different. And when the difference can't be seen in us, we're in trouble. God help us. We don't belong to the world anymore. First Corinthians five verses nine and ten. Paul says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave the world. What Paul's saying right there, don't you? We, we cannot get away from sin. But we don't have to be like that. We don't have to salute and pledge allegiance to the worldliness that we used to live in. Because we're separated from the world. We're set apart for God's use. That's what the word sanctified means. We have been sanctified. We've been set apart for God's use. So we know we're separated from the world. And number five, how about that? A five-point sermon, and you've almost lived through it. <laughs> Number five, we can know this, the greatest of all Christian certainties. Jesus is God's son. He is truth. He is eternal life. Verse 20 is what tells us this. First John 5. We know also that the son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in Him true by being in His Son, Jesus. He is the true God. He is eternal life. All these things that I have preached this morning, all these points that I've shared with you, it's a case of world versus word. The world says Jesus was a great man. But the word says Jesus is God's son. The world says Jesus was a great teacher. But the Bible says Jesus is the savior of the world. It comes down to this, people. Who will you believe? 
Who are we going to believe? I think God's got a good track record. I'm going his way. Want to go with me? If you need to repent of sin, today's your day. If you need to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, today's the day. If you need to come and confess and ask for strength and prayers, today's the day. Because God has made us promises that He will not go back on. Do you need them? Do you want them? If you do, you're welcome to come down and let us know. If you can stand with me, do that. And let's sing His praise.